Okay guys, so we are going to continue on with what happens after the French and Indian War. The and first thing you need to realize is the French and Indian War slash Seven Years War, hugely expensive. Parliament incurred a ton of debt. And at some point, the British are going to want to, in some way, get rid of this debt. And this is going to mean that the Brits are going to say goodbye to salutary neglect when it comes to the colonies. Salutary neglect means healthy neglect. Even though you had the Navigation Acts in place, you allowed people in the Americas to kind of decide a lot of their own policies via the colonial assemblies. They taxed themselves. Oh, no more. A guy named George Grenville rises to the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer, which in Britain is the guy who controls all the money. And he thinks to himself, well, I need to levy some new taxes on the colonists who, after all, supposedly benefited from this war. Grenville says that taxes are going to be levied by Parliament and not the colonial assemblies. The Sugar Act is going to be passed, but it raises money for England in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, you had tariffs to control who the colonists traded with, but the Sugar Act isn't about controlling trade. It's about raising revenue. The colonists are gonna feel as if this new revenue raising tax violates their rights as British subjects because the colonial assemblies were the places that were supposed to levy regular taxes. And, and, and why was that? It's because the people in the colonies put into power the colonial assemblies. They didn't vote on ministers of parliament, the people who controlled parliament in Britain. Mm, is this kind of the foundation for that no taxation without representation cry that I'm sure you've heard of in the past? So how could Parliament justify making this drastic sort of shift, uh, moving from we're controlling your trade because you're part of our empire to we're taking money from you, we're charging you taxes, we're paying down a debt that you helped create? They had this concept that was called parliamentary sovereignty. Now, sovereignty that has at its root sovereign a sovereign is king you might remember in this moment that parliament had established supremacy in the 1600s how did they do that <laughs> they chopped off a king's head charles the first remember during the english civil war and and then and then they made the decision to put the king back on the throne but uh, they deposed James II. They didn't like how he ruled, and they said, you're out. <laughs> we, Parliament is bigger than you. They put William and Mary onto the throne, but with conditions. Y'all aren't really totally in charge. And Parliament, not the monarchs, had ultimate authority over taxation. They made the laws of the land. By the time George III is on the throne, Parliament is the ultimate power. They trump the king. Now, not to say that the king isn't important because he's still super powerful, but they, they are more powerful, bigger. And if they can trump King George III, oh my goodness, they are certainly more powerful than some little provincial colonial assemblies across the water living in the backwoods, hicks in the sticks. What? A, yes, we can tax you. In addition, colonists, we know you have your colonial assemblies that look sort of like British Parliament. We know that you believe that you should be able to control these assemblies to some extent because the government has its power through the consent of the governed John Locke, blah, 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 blah. But Parliament is supreme over the empire 
and members of parliament are all, we got your back. We're thinking about you. You are virtually represented through this body because we are the supreme power and you are, you're in our family. You're some of our children. Virtual representation is just as good as you voting for this minister of parliament or that minister of parliament. We're not saying taxation without representation. Atticus, what did colonists think about virtual representation? Did they like it? Clearly that was a no. Virtual representation to colonists was a literally stupid concept. Additionally, in the colonies, you had something called the Commonwealth Tradition. This was based on the ideas of two guys, John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon. And they had this thought that power will destroy liberty unless it is countered by virtue. Let me say that again. Power will destroy liberty unless it is countered by virtue. In other words, bad policy often comes with evil intent. It can be evidence of sin and corruption. This is a strange merging of religion and political theory. From the early 1760s, right after the French and Indian War was won, the colonists will go from celebrating their Britishness to thinking that the Brits in Parliament want to destroy American liberty because they are bad people. By 1774, one declaration in the colonies, for example, said, quote, the present ministry being instigated by the devil and led by their wicked and corrupt hearts have a design to take away our liberties and properties and to enslave us forever, end quote. Britain's leaders were described as pimps, parasites. But understand, these grievances are heartfelt. These disputes over what is good and bad policy become disputes of what is good and evil. Oh, hey, hey by, by the way, do Americans who engage in politics in the United States today ever do this? Instead of saying, oh, Republicans, I don't like your tax policy, or Democrats, I don't like your social safety net, they go, oh, you're stealing from me, you're bad. Oh, you're taking from others because you're bad. Bad, 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 bad. We're going to try and claw each other's eyes out because uh, we fight our politics with a religious zeal. Is I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just throwing out an idea there. I, I don't know if that's what we do. I, 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 can we see any evidence of that where we point at our leaders and say, no, we don't just have disagreements. We think you're evil, pimps, parasites. People start engaging in conspiracy theories. Isn't that funny? From the very, very, very beginning of our country, we have loved conspiracies. And conspiracies are all about the passions. And it doesn't mean that there's not a little bit of truth within a conspiracy, but um, I can't tell you if all the members of parliament in Britain actually wanted to come over here and stick chains on all the American people and maybe kidnap their children and suck the marrow out of their bones and maybe have King George take those bones and use them as toothpicks because he was a horrible, terrible monster bent on our destruction. I can tell you that some of the feelings will be fueled by real things that are policy disagreements uh, that make people angry for good reason. So after the Sugar Act, which really didn't inspire, it inspired bad feeling, but it didn't hit everyone. So it didn't inspire widespread action. You had something called the Stamp Act. This was passed in 1765 and it taxed all paper products. Let me say that again, all paper products. So 
the stamp is the thing that you put onto the paper. It's not just the stamp that you would put on a piece of mail. So if you got a marriage license, you had to pay this tax and put the stamp on the marriage license. Or if you bought some playing cards to hang out with your friends and have something to do, you had to pay this tax, get the stamp, put it on the paper product. It affects all sorts of aspects of life. You're going to have to pay your nickel to the parliament. You can't get out of it. And people really hate this, which is why Sam Adams is able to form a secret resistance group called the Sons of Liberty. It's why the newspapers are so easily able to whip up emotion. You're paying a tax without your voice being heard. Um, Patrick Henry is going to be able to push through the Virginia resolutions. Uh, Patrick Henry is a founding father who is from Virginia, obviously, and he is famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death. Um, you have women who will organize and they will have a giant boycott throughout the colonies of British goods. And you may not, you may not realize it, but women had a lot of power in some respects. We lived in a certain type of society in which their power was gained from their husbands. Your position was based on the position or status of the men in your life, but women, controlled the money in the household often. What does that mean? The guy would go out and earn the money and then he would hand it to his wife and she would decide how that money was spent. That is, that's power. So she starts making her own clothes, making her baby's clothes and make buying from the local artisan instead of from the Brits. It was uh, save your money, save your country. Uh, we're all in this together. We're having this organized boycott of all of these things that we possibly can that come from Britain with the desire to repeal the Stamp Act. Sometimes protests were violent in the streets, um, which is not good, but there were, there was this larger peaceful movement too. So it was kind of a confluence of things and this is going to be successful because it is very directed. There was a specific thing that was being asked for and the colonists were hugely united in it. You didn't have a lot of different feelings. Everyone dislikes the Stamp Act. It gets repealed, but Parliament then says, we're going to make a declaration. They put forth the Declaratory Act, which is what I like to call the I'm your daddy act. <laughs> yes, I'm going to give you what you want, but we're going to declare we are still supreme. We're still sovereign, you little people. So just keep that in mind because later on we might do something else. And they do. <laughs> A guy named Charles Townsend rises to power as the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He passes the Townsend Acts in 1767, which include all sorts of little taxes and also enforcement provisions that really annoy the colonists. And this by 1770 will bring us to an event in March that we call the Boston Massacre. It is an interaction between colonists and soldiers which uh, is something that bears a lot of thought. Both sides have different versions of the event that we remember as the Boston Massacre. And it is really a period in which we test a principle. What is more important, mob justice, the feelings of the people getting to determine a verdict, or the rule no, of law. No one could question his credentials as a revolutionary who believed in liberty. John Adams will stand with the rule of law. Pay attention to that in the rest of the daily work that I'll assign.